The following podcast contains strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and welcome. My name is Craft Ginger and this is Roll for Discussion, a small podcast where myself and a few others will delve into the multiple topics around the popular game of Dungeons and Dragons. If you have any thoughts, opinions about what has been discussed or topics that you want us to cover, then feel free to post them down below in the comments section. If you enjoy this content, please leave us a like and smash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell for more. In tonight's session, we'll be covering where else to start other than the tavern. This is Roll for Discussion. Joining me in tonight's session, we have Schnitzel. Hello. We have Chad Stick. Hello. We have Peter. Hiya. And finally, we have Rumble. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, at the time of this recording, we already have our first session. Uh, session zero is uploaded, uploaded now. Uh, so if anyone out there is watching, hopefully you've been with us since the beginning and you haven't gotten sick and tired of our voices like we have yet. So well done. Thank you very much for sticking around. We really appreciate that. In tonight's episode, we are obviously talking about alternative starting ideas because uh, I think that the, uh, the trope of everybody starting in a tavern it is a little bit, I don't know, basic, overused, whatever other words you want to use. So we want to look around, go around the table here, and see if anyone can come up with some alternative ones. So I want to start this off with uh, Chadstick. What sort of uh, alternative, that, alternative starting locations have you gone for? Well, um, not intentionally, but I've actually, I don't think I've ever in fact started a campaign in a tavern. Oh really? Um, yeah. And I just want to, I listened back to the first uh, episode because I wasn't invited in there, probably for good reason, based on my performance last episode. Um, we, uh, yeah, for, for someone said that starting in a tavern isn't actually a problem, and I want to rectify that, like, I, I, or agree with that. Like, you can start in a tavern. It makes perfect sense for adventurers to meet in a tavern. Where are you all going to go, you know, to relax, to look for work or look for trouble? get near to the ground so for those of you who do start your campaigns in a tavern it's absolutely fine um but if you don't want to if you're looking for something new literally anywhere uh let me go through a quick list um fresh off the boat is one of mine that i quite like where you've the party have all individually uh, as part of their character generation i've told them look you're going to you as a character are going to this place which is, you know, give them some background on that place. Um, so one of the ones that I did was, it's like in the, the kind of the frozen north area. It's uh, newly discovered and people were exploring it. And um, that I gave them a whole pile of in-game lore and said, from that, you can just come up with a reason why your character would be going there. Or you can give me a reason of your own. But like one of the characters was running away from a crime that they'd committed. Um, that kind of stuff so they were they didn't know each other beforehand but they got off the boat and they were at the dock and they basically saw each other and identified each other as you know a sort of people who would probably be just trustworthy enough to get on with and competent enough to defend themselves so um i, I quite like that one and um a, a variation of that is, uh, and you can talk, uh, I really wish uh, Midge or Zenith were here because they were in a campaign of mine where they did a similar start and they were on a wagon um, and they'd been going to this remote Lord's area and he'd been suffering some bandit attacks and he, uh, they'd all signed up to the campaign. It's, uh, I called it the Relics of Vorna because it's all about them becoming relic hunters and for things made by the gods and um so the, this particular baron was going to pay them with a map to where one of these relics was supposedly buried so that was the reason for them to go there and clean out these bandits for him um and i also hid a little bit of lore in that first session that i don't think anyone who's ever run it has actually picked up on sadly but it's there 
Um, so one day I hope a player will turn around and go, my god, remember those bandits in that magical mine? Um, who were doing that summoning ritual? And I'll be like, yeah, I know. I, that's, that's it, that's the hook. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I like, I quite like telling the players that, you know, I don't railroad their character gen, but I tell the players, you are going to this place that is like this. Here is a reason that you are interested in going, or that might be interested in going. But you, you know, I give them a hook, but if they want to come up with their own reason why they're getting involved in that journey, they can do that. And it helps. I find that really helps a lot of players think about their, like their character's character, how they can role play, what they, you know, what their character is looking out for in the campaign. So it gives them a step up on that. Um, another one was uh, that I played in that I really enjoyed. We um, we were just pirates on a ship, uh, and our captain had died, so we had to elect a new leader. Um, and uh, yeah, that was that was really fun because we all got to like assign ourselves role on the roles on the crew. Um, I got to be the captain, but that really <laughs> everybody else was like, "How's how's Chad managed to maneuver himself into a position of authority again?" Um, <laughs> and uh, what really happened was everybody else was actually really good at the other roles, and I was like the charismatic face kind of character. Um, so I just basically told everybody to do what they wanted to do anyway, and it worked out. Um, yeah, like generally anything that gives the group uh, an individual reason and a group reason to be there, I like. So, fresh off the wagon or fresh off the boat is my preference. It's not. Uh, it's not a bad couple of choices there. I do like the the sort of difference to it. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest. The, the, the starting in the tavern, uh, uh, I guess, cliche as it were. I don't mind it too much, but I would say that after being in a few campaigns and having it be in the same setup each time does for me feel a little bit repetitive. So, I mean, if it was like starting a tavern, but something else, like completely other different, you didn't just start off by, you know, getting some drinks and playing some games in there. Like some, I don't know, something came rampaging into the tavern. You know, you necessarily wouldn't be sitting there with the rest of the party, but it might give you a motivational reason as to why you'd all suddenly come together. Because I think that's, for me, that's what it is. The, the key is, it's, it's the motivation, it's the background. It's like, what is it that's brought all these different people like to join forces? So one idea I've, uh, I've been looking at um, is for a homebrew campaign where it's, it's based in a sort of like a wasteland and there's limited transportation, one of which is, uh, is going to be trains. And so uh, the distance is because the distance is between like the seas and stuff are so uh, so fast that it's probably one of the only uh, real uh, methods of transportation left. So you'll have these all these uh, starting players on that heading off to a location. This is where they can choose what's the reason why they're going to that location. Uh, and then, like I say, there'd be things like interacting uh, with it. Yeah, man. Um, I'm excited about that campaign. I love trains. <laughs> trains, like dragons and trains, would be a great RPG. Dragons and trains. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I agree. I think it's a good idea because you're giving them a purpose, like to be in the campaign. The problem with the tavern setting is you're like, oh, you've gone for a Friday night drink. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what about you? Uh, what about you, Pete? I mean, I think. I, maybe maybe we're crossing into it almost like partially it's a different conversation maybe it's not it's not where you're starting that's the problem it's why you're starting there or what is your reason for being there like if it's if it is just the tavern of oh you're in a tavern you just happen to be in a tavern and now you're off on an adventure maybe that's I think is what you're saying with the whole it gets a bit boring but I, I think being in a tavern with a purpose that's interesting is something that's more okay like i've seen stuff like online and it's like you have all like received letters summoning you to a tavern that's more interesting than just we're in a tavern now yay um but like i've seen i've been in a campaign before where we've had it was a guild like the idea was that you are all in a in a guild group or party or whatever and you have been you know, teamed up and sent off on a quest, and that's your reason. And I think that can be quite an interesting start as well. It, although I, I find in some cases its limitations are 
how do you turn a simple guild quest for a level one party into a long, like, campaign where it links into each other rather than just I finish the quest, I return. I finish the quest, I return. So it's, I think it it it'll depend on personal preference, but it's it's also it's a it's a cliche for a reason. Like it works, and it's sometimes maybe it's about just shoving people together in you know as quickly as possible so the campaign can actually get going rather than trying to find a convoluted way to make the start interesting when maybe the rest of the campaign is what you should be thinking about. It's actually a, not a bad point now. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Rumpel? Um, well, I was kind of... you. I was kind of thinking something you kind of briefly touched on when you were just talking about the game that you're planning for the future. I think it can heavily depend on the setting of the game itself and the mood you're trying to set across like if you want the players themselves to find their place in the world you've created kind of naturally and steadily and find out there's something going on that they can go and discover then i suppose like a tavern makes sense you just kind of randomly kind of coming together if you want to set out straight from the off that there's a threat or, or there's this issue this problem this kind of thing that's gonna need attention you almost want to bring that as a reason to why these people would come together so like um i on the first games i actually ever played um the starting hook was um a, the big base is basically like a new year's day celebration it was the big new year day celebration in the capital city why would you have been going there to go and you know celebrate and then in things happened there that ended up bringing everyone together and likewise i think so it all depends on the game you're trying to play like if you want a heavily combat focus maybe there's wars going on you could literally start it on a battlefield per se you've got people that have come together to join the fight or maybe the battle has spread into a town where people are and you could have people starting out that were soldiers maybe people shopkeepers whatever you know or if you want a kind of more you want to introduce the big bad straight away maybe they're all prisoners within his castle you've got to get out you start with nothing you know people come together that way you could almost push everyone together and set the mood right from the outset so okay to yeah no it sounds it sounds pretty good uh schnitzel any thoughts i only have one thought at all times, but the thought I have about this is um, that I love variety. Whatever we can do as uh, players or as DMs to change up what we normally do, because as I agree, doing the same thing over and over is played out, but anything, like just think of something that'd be like, this would be insane to try. Try it, just, just experiment. I think the most fun part about D&D is that you get to escape might as well escape to something that is a little bit crazier than maybe you thought you would try. So that's what I would enjoy. Uh, I've always enjoyed the ones that start off with like, well, this is a very unusual thing. I have no idea where we're going to go from here. And at a tavern, you can kind of figure out like, oh, I, I, we're probably going to go on a quest. We're probably going to all get together and try to find, you know, rather searching for something or trying to find somebody. But the more variety I love any kind of way anything try it all okay so we seem to have a bit of um, we have some like similar views here and some uh, a little bit different so I'm going to open the, the floor up then if anyone wants to uh, want to counter someone else's point or if you like, you want to expand on what someone else has said uh, so it's free reign whoever speaks first goes first and everyone else be quiet right I'll be quick then <laughs> um, I also, I mean, I put my hand up in like the chat channel. I thought we could do that, and then you could look at it and like cue us and stuff. Oh, um, that's a good shout! Yes. Or I'm always happy to shout. Like this is about D and D, and we can be a party. You can be the GM and laugh as we argue amongst yeah. ourselves about, mm. about the best way to cook a carrot. Um, <laughs> no, you know what? That's good. Let me redo that. Let me just redo that bit then, because that's actually a really good. That's actually a brilliant idea. That's it's, good. it's almost like I'm a. A professional DM and a teacher. <laughs> <laughs>
the expertise is, is, is very well needed. <laughs> You'd be surprised, man. Like, <laughs> I've had, I, like, I, I think being a DM has, has put me in a good place for dealing with the weird stuff that kids come out with. <laughs> and the weird stuff that kids come out with has put me Wait. in a good place for being a DM. Wait, hold up. You're a professional DM? Mm hmm. How does that work? I get paid. Oh, so it's, I suppose the technical term would be semi professional, but. Okay. But no, but I mean, like, what I mean is, like, are these people you know and they just pay you, or do you do it at like, um, a shop or something? So I do it at a shop. Um, originally, I was doing it at a geek retreat. Um, because my friend was running it and he asked me to get involved and they were paying me with dinner um and i was a bit Majestic. privately uh I, I don't know if this is um gonna be a <laughs> kept in feel free to put it as a gag reel but i wasn't particularly happy that i was being <laughs> unpaid for my time so i ordered as much as i could for dinner um mm. and the food was good i enjoyed it um so i was i was effectively being paid about 20 quid a night there um i just had to spend the money on the food it was all good and um yeah then continued on um where the geek retreat uh, closed for a flurry of reasons i won't go into now um but my group stayed together we're having a great time most of them were new one of them was my mate but most of them were very new and they've they've really come a long way i've super enjoyed the campaign and um yeah uh, what i normally do so we're at a different shop now um and they are not being paid by them but i do do uh sessions other uh, other places where it's like i think it's 10 pounds uh, hang on right yes with my price plan up stored on my computer uh 10 pound a session plus five per player um so for like three people four pe for four people it's 30 quid for a four hour session um and I do that every two or three weeks with another group. This this actually, I think, would this would actually go quite well, I think, in a topic that hasn't been listed that I think we should probably uh, set up. Uh, about what, how to respect DMs for their time, effort, and the amount of work they put in? <laughs> well, just, uh, i say they argue, put the, the case of um, uh, free to play or pay to pay, uh, pay to play. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that. Um, yeah. Basically, I, I mainly I, the, so the two to three week thing is uh, online through Raw20 um, and that's pretty good it's a group of people from different areas um, who got in touch with me through Facebook so they don't know each other well they do now but they all knew me vaguely um, but I also like I'll do solo events or stuff I think I'm doing a birthday party for one of my players teenage children offspring <laughs> young <laughs> um, yeah um i think it's a daughter but there's like four of them who want to give it a go so uh i'm going to run a session i'm only charging 20 quid for that but normally like if i was doing a, a paid session from not a friend i'd be like 50 quid for four or five hours of play and it's like a one shot that they get to go through oh i would definitely yeah i'd uh, like to definitely get into a, a topic on that one so we'll uh, we'll pencil that aside um so, I'm just going to restart the bit after Schnitzel had spoken. So, it sounds like you've all got uh, different opinions. Uh, also, maybe some of you have got a little bit of a similar one. So, if anyone wants to put their hand up, uh, let us know if there's something that they would like to bounce back off of what someone else has already said. Maybe expand upon it or maybe have a counter argument. Uh, I see, Chad, you got your hand up? I do, yes. Very organised. Um, and it was a great idea. I wonder where you came up with it. Um, <laughs> um, so my, I remembered that I've, I've been in one campaign where I played and we started in a tavern. Um, and it was the weakest start of any campaign I've ever had. Now, I enjoyed the campaign. I'd created a character who was uh, <laughs> very annoying for the GM. Um, but I talked to the GM first about it to make sure he was okay and understood what I was going with. He was also a new GM, uh, but I don't think that impacted on the weakness of the start. That's not his fault. He was playing um, uh, the Waterdeep. Uh, All right. The Waterdeep book. And you start in a tavern, but you basically have no reason to be there. And so it's just kind of free form. You sit in a tavern and you go for a little bit. And I think 
what's meant to be implied is that you start talking to the other party members, but I got in a fight with the bartender because um, I had the wrong shaped coins because uh, I came from somewhere else. And um, then during that, uh, the I, I forgot who it was. One of us got thrown into a troll and there was a big bar fight that not every member of the party decided to get involved with and I completely understand that. Um, but only after we finished that did the um, quest giver arrive. And I feel like... We didn't have a purpose, so I kind of did whatever I wanted to. Um, and that steered the party into having to... Like, they didn't have to get involved, but they had to then sit through that sequence. And I, w I can be quite an awkward player, I'll admit. But only in the pursuit of fun and interesting, amusing things. I wouldn't have done that if I'd had more direction. Like, if I'd been told, oh, you're, you've come down here to start work. Uh, you've come down here for whatever. And again, I don't think it's the GM's fault campaign was good fun i think he ran it very well especially considering it was one of his first times doing it but i think the book just let him down by saying they meet in a tavern let them do what they want to do for a few minutes and that's that's hard to steer i think for any gm but especially a new one yeah that's a that's a valid uh, valid point there mate uh Rumpel, did you have something to say for that yeah i just think that you hit a very good note there in the fact that a tavern it's all up to the players to decide in that exact moment why they're there and it doesn't nest like a tavern isn't a good place of why you would necessarily interact with everyone mm -hmm. if you just say you're in a tavern and start game well there's no reason for me to go talk to the half orc at the bar there's no reason for me to talk to the tiefling in the corner it's there has to be something there to kickstart it mm. and a tavern is very very limited in what events that can be now like you said like a bar fight that can be one but as you just pointed out it's you know if people aren't going to get involved in that the game stagnates you need something to bring them together which a tavern can be a hard place to actually put that event into it's, yeah. it's like a it's a small box that you mm. need to put something into exactly that's a really good phrase small box because there are reasons to go to a tavern right aren't there mm. like if you imagine like oh you go to a tavern well you haven't just walked down the street and thought i'll go sit in that nice looking place where they serve alcohol that's slightly disreputable in appearance you know it's not there are limited options for why you have gone to the tavern unless you've been told why you've gone and I think that steers players into being uh, trouble causers yeah yeah I've also, yeah that's I, I haven't to be honest I've never been in a campaign that actually starred in a tavern so I'd, I'd never known where it goes from there but I can see how that would end up being a more yeah trouble causing route down for the party hmm. okay um Okay, so I have, uh, I have a question for all of you. If you were forced to pick a starting location that wasn't a tavern, and uh, say you could pick maybe two or three, what would you? What areas would you pick? Is this like a timed exercise? Do we have two minutes to go away and think <laughs> for ourselves? No, 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 no. Just for just throwing a random, random, random curveball to see what you guys come up with. Okay. <laughs> Prison. A uh, prison. You know what I've had? Yeah, I've heard. I was speaking to a friend yesterday um, about alternative locations, and prison was the first thing he came up with, which I thought was a quite interesting one. You stick. You know, everyone's been in there for. Well, they can come up with the reasons why they were arrested, and then so the, uh, so the task would then be, like, uh, they're going to try to break out together. So I thought that wasn't, a, that wasn't actually too bad an idea. I might try to use that at some point. Yeah. Um, thinking about it, I have started a campaign in a prison. And what you said there, again, it gives people a thought. It's like, why, am I, why is my character in prison? And it helps their, their character generation, you know? And again, it gives them a direction. Do you guys find it'd be, it, it, it works better for the campaign if... Uh, so they did have it all uh, they were all having the same sort of motivation as to like what they're going to do next or they just have 
Oh yeah, I don't know how to best phrase this. I guess the question would be, what sort of difficulties have you come across if you've got everybody, or nearly everybody in the party, with different motivations uh, to do something, and they don't, they're not sharing in anything, so that there's there's almost no reason why they would come together. I think I think that's something that needs to be addressed in session zero. I think the part that's part of it's like you want the group, you want it to naturally work you want it to flow you want everyone to have a motivation the groups together but that's not always easy and then i think sometimes maybe it falls on the players to be like you know what like we're just starting out let's cut the dm some slack and flow with it and i think that might uh be you know how that kind of works is it might be difficult it might not make sense and it might not make but that's when the the party has to try and kind of flow and be like We'll let it happen, even if it might not be easier, especially if it's a new DM that hasn't had the time to kind of make it work very easily. I agree with that. I also, I always do like a soft enforcement for my characters or for my players. I say, your character has chosen to get involved in this profession, this quest, this story for a reason. So come up with a reason that you're you can have other reasons you can have other quest objectives and like personal objectives you want to achieve in the campaign but there must be something that's drawn your character towards this path because otherwise that's when i think a lot of people go down the murder mobo mur 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 murder <laughs> hobo route <clears throat> yes the murder hobo route uh because their character has no interest like they've they've got no attachment to the plot line so i do a soft enforcement um and as Peter said, I think a lot of players are like, oh, okay, cool. If the DM has said that, then sure. I don't railroad them, but they have to have a, you know, just a little bit, a little bit of a reason to get involved in the shared campaign. Uh, does anybody have uh, anything else they want to uh, touch upon with uh, alternative starting ideas? I, I came up with an idea for a, a starting point. I think I want to try um starting uh I've, i would i want to do a campaign where i give them a brief and then they start off in an entirely different situation and they've got to try to work out what's going on and just like the psycho so they've told them oh you're all soldiers in an army you're going to invade this this lich king's castle etc and then they wake up and they're um like on they're, top of a mountain or something oh, i was gonna say teachers in a school Oh, right. <laughs> and, um, and they're like, what's going on? And it's going to be like a psychological thriller thing where they're actually trapped in some kind of you know, mental prison and they've got to work their way out of it that way. But I just want to see the looks on the faces of my players when they're like, I'm a barbarian with a great axe dedicated to the path of the bear. How am I meant to be teaching English four times this day and once RE? What's going on? This isn't the campaign I signed up for. And then I want them to go through that what the fuck moment. How how long at curiosity would you have that that go? I've seen like conversations with like I've seen stuff about like almost the bait and switch of I'm gonna tell my party they're doing this and then I'm gonna completely pull the rug out from underneath them. Like how long would you keep the kind of like oh you're not where I said you would be going for? Because I I know like per like personally if I went and joined a campaign they're like this is what you're going to do you're going to be doing this and then they were like ignore everything i've told you i'm going to completely switch it up like would would that be like a long-term change like would the entire campaign sort of switch out from beneath them or or would that be like a session or two and then they're straight back on with what they thought they were doing so i didn't explain it well enough you raise a good point peter thank you they are still trying to attack the lich king's castle they've just been during this assault they've been caught under the effects of a spell that makes puts them in this alternate universe Okay. Um, and so they'd, they'd have this what, what the hell moment, they'd start acting through it, and then I'd drop subtle hints that things weren't quite right. You know, like um, the barbarian might still be able to rage, etc. And I'd drop story things that they could try to figure out a puzzle between them in the, the school um, to break the spell. Um, okay. So by the end of the first session, they should at least know that it's not real, but ideally. Uh, and in the uh, so I always give like because I love writing. Um, uh, uh, I I love creative fiction. Uh, it's why I do a lot of what I do. 
um, I always provide a lot of background law. So at, at the end of that law, I would put like in bold and underline, yeah. remember, this is your mission. Whatever happens, you must infiltrate the castle and destroy this thing. Whatever happens, do not forget that. So they'd read that as the last thing that was very clearly as an instruction. And then when they got put in this alternate situation, like maybe if they were meant to destroy a certain gem, I'd have like a number of gems that are in difficult to access areas of the school that they'd have to destroy to break the spell. So it would run on thematically. Okay. I hope. Well, I'll see how it goes when I do it. Ooh, sounds good. Oh uh, yeah, tell us how that goes. Uh, once you uh, once you've actually got it going. Uh, Shinzo, uh, do you have any ideas for alternative uh, starting locations? Um. Well, the one I heard about starting at war sounds really really fun because um, a lot of the ones we do, at least the ones I've been involved in, we start off and we don't know really what the world events are happening, if that makes sense. Like, there's never a, oh, by the way, there's a giant war going on. It's always, we're so enclosed to the actual quest we're doing. So it'd be very fun to start off and it's like there's this grand overarching plot going on of a war and that we're a part of that war for either side or we're spies or something involved in that but that way you feel like you're doing more than like the world than just oh we're just questing to go get a dragon because we want to make money i feel like that would be very very fun i would love to be involved with a D, D campaign that starts off and with a giant overarching plot that's no, not bad not bad idea i guess it could also sort of expand a little bit more for the characters uh when they want to work on their like backstories and stuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I just enjoy I enjoy war as like in history. And I think it would be very fun to be like at the end of the whole quest and everything. They come back and they say, um, "You guys were long remembered as great warriors and." fought this battle it would it would feel like you really accomplished something more than just oh we did it because my character loves money hmm. i like it i think that's a really really cool idea yeah i guess you could sort of cover that in the session you'd cover that in the session zero then wouldn't you like you give give the players um a little a couple of you know pa uh, paragraphs description about the world itself and then yeah you could sort of feed into like what Nathan was saying there you know gives you a bit more to the story makes you feel a little bit makes the world feel a bit more fleshed out it might actually help towards them like motivations to doing something like later on down the line so maybe when you you have a particular quest you've also got that information in the back of your head and so you think oh well I could just go and pick this item up for so and so but actually this particular land is being controlled by i don't know wherever this invading army is right now so maybe i don't want to go and get him this uh, particular item. maybe i'm going to go take it somewhere else yeah my favorite uh person my favorite like fantasy my favorite science fiction whichever one you want to call it like uh genre or uh i don't know what the word i'm looking for is a uh, group uh hmm. is, is uh, lord of the rings um lord of the rings is my favorite and uh, the thing I love most about Lord of the Rings is that there's this like overarching plot for decades and centuries before and after the the um, the movies that you feel like as you're watching it, you feel like every single thing is going to be memorialized in history. I feel like that would just give a lot more. Um, it'd give a motivation that, that way the, the, the players don't have to be searching for their motivation as they go along and it would be a lot more unified and okay our purpose is to win this this battle this war something like that and um you can do make it much easier to do smaller like uh personality smaller personality traits that maybe make people fight and, and fight amongst themselves but not to the point where it could end badly where people are like well my character's a double crosser so he's gonna double cross people it's like okay well in that case you can just devolve I feel like something that we've 
all kind of touched on is that a strong opening can help with like strong motivations which can not only keep the party going but keep the the plot interesting hmm. which is cool. so i think ultimately then the tavern after after this uh, bit of discussion ultimately the tavern uh, isn't so much relevant uh, so really the location is not so much relevant it's more uh, the, the reasons uh, the world setting that sort of thing so you can you can always then stick with uh, the very uh, the very standard tavern thing but if you've got a pretty good uh, reason for everyone to be there it won't it won't matter so much I oh, hang on no I am I do have my mic on yes I agree like you can be in a tavern but if you're a squad of soldiers on your you know your your off duty time in the tavern away from the front lines that you know gives you greater context for your place in the story that's about to unfold uh, mm. unfold and i think that's that's what we're all hitting on really players need context and they they want to be part of a story yeah mm, well, i think we've um, i think we've covered uh, alternative uh, starting ideas quite well now so we're going to move on to the next topic uh, which is when is it okay to tpk now, uh, Peter, would you just explain to anyone listening who doesn't know what TPK is or means, if you want to point uh, Cool. Uh, TPK, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong anyone, is total party kill or total player kill. Um, and it just means that the entire party has died for one way or another. And it'll happen usually in one combat or without them having a chance to bring in new characters, etc. etc. between deaths. So, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Also, also Sorry. known as the dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, Two types of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alright, okay. So, I'm wondering here, uh, so obviously I want to know what everyone's sort of thoughts are on this about, obviously, when do they feel that it's okay to TPK. So I'm going to start with, uh, go top of the list and work our way down. So, uh, Schnitzel. Now, I, I don't believe that you've had the experience of being a DM yourself, um, so this should be quite interesting. When do you think it would be appropriate, if at all, to TPK? Never. <laughs> Never. I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> One word. I hate, I hate TPK. I hate dying in D and D because you know why? I'm the one who always dies first. I don't know yeah. how. It's always me. I'm, wasn't always you the rogue me. that ran in first? As if you heard the barbarian raid. Yes. Stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yes. No. I, I, I am not that good at staying alive. And um, that's, a, that's a terrible character trait to have. Yeah, I know. I know. No, but like, more you chose. I, yeah. I I'm just. I, I, I thought, I think that with D&D, the like, you should make it tough on people, you know, like, dying should be a possibility, but I think it should be hard enough that dying is actually surprising. Um, and to be a situation where everyone dies, I feel like as a DM, there's something that happened and miscommunicated in it that something went wrong. Because if everyone's dying, that's not probably how the story's supposed to go. Unless you planned it that everyone was going to die. And that's different but if you were like okay i want everyone to win and everybody dies i feel like that's a little bit on the dm for not maybe explaining to the characters a little bit more of what needs to happen and uh that's just again i could be wrong but i don't i don't love dying i haven't seen it <laughs> way too much but i feel like when characters die it's some on the character and the person who's doing the character but some on the dm too because the dm i think also should help a character that is not really familiar or maybe a little new into a way of not dying you know be like okay well if do you sure you want to do that move because this is going to happen are you sure you want to do that because um and just help out new characters and new people that are seem to be prone to dying and uh and let people like me know that hey what you're going to do is probably going to die you might want to do a little bit like this and we'll listen i promise we'll listen because we're very new to it so tpk not a big fan at all not okay, no, fair enough. Um, I would uh, say before I go, say what my my view about CPK. I think I would actually counter. Uh, I would have to have a counter to what you're saying there, because I, I definitely I can supervise when you have a new player, um, and maybe you're looking for a bit of advice or anything. But I don't see that the DM. 
I guess it comes down to the personality of the DM, but I personally would say, like, if you if you're trying to go a bit easy on your party, that's fine. But then I don't think you're really uh, fulfilling the the true role of the DM, and you shouldn't. I, I personally don't think you should try pulling your punches with it. Like, if you've if you've told the party, at, like in that session zero, you know there are going to be fights you're coming across, and it could very well kill you, your while well, your character, then. You know, I think then whatever happens going forward, then will can pretty much then fall on the player because obviously you're rolling dice and stuff, but you're 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 making decisions about what your player is going to do. So if you don't pay attention to what was said at the beginning, and you go into a fight thinking, oh, the DM's going to go easy on me, then you're obviously going to get a bit of a rude surprise. Uh, that being said, I don't think like you know the DM. I don't think DMs intentionally go out of their way to try to kill people, but if you like start fudging your rolls. And stuff just because you know you don't want people to lose their characters I, th I think you sort of take something away you know it's almost i don't know it's like it's almost like you're playing a video game and you've entered some cheat codes it's like ah, oh, well you know that, that should have killed me but now i've given myself infinite health you know what i mean yeah i get it um what, what an interesting pair of uh, stances that i'm gonna disagree with um in both directions Ooh. i uh I think my answer to the question, when is it okay to TPK, is literally any day of the week. Um, <laughs> but it's also, I think any TPK is 100% on the GM. And you should pull punches at certain times. I have a, a personal rule when I design campaigns and encounters that and, and any particular encounter is unlikely to seriously threaten the party as a whole or even down players depending on decisions until they're level three um, because this gives the party time to get used to each other their characters how they fight and that you know that's when uh and i say this things get real at level three you get all your cool stuff you're now responsible for your own lives it's not that the gloves are, gloves are off but until then i'm more setting the scene and the story uh the other thing is um uh, this doesn't apply to my youngest brother um, because he asked me never to fudge dice for him and so in the two sessions that I run involving him which were both like first sessions he has been crit and killed in the first round but not killed but not gone conscious in the first round of combat by a goblin with a knife um, and that is for players that's a negative play experience in, like, and it can happen so I think you should fudge your rolls as a GM depending on the moment like it's not appropriate that someone goes down in the first round of combat necessarily in their first session especially for new players so you can you know you can just pull the wool over their eyes and make it a big hit you know what hit points they've got and ultimately it's your responsibility to tell a story if you kill the entire party the story has to finish unless you come up with something fancy however i also feel like something you said crafty is true which which is uh, a lot of what you've said is true. Pardon, not just one thing. Um, <laughs> I have uh, my moments. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A few, apparently one. Uh, no, um, but the GM should make it dangerous and difficult. So after level three, that's when um, stuff like my encounters get a little more lethal. And I usually get my players to level three fairly quickly. Like by the third session, you're probably level three because I've made the players or set enough stuff up for the players to have done by then to achieve it and so after that point i don't pull punches unless it's a particularly un like if it's the last skeleton in a fight and he crits a wizard and kills him i'm not going to have that happen if it's just like a, a bandit ambush because that's not how i imagine it happening but if it's however the last skeleton and they're trying to cleanse a tomb as part of a story mission and it would be a uh, you know a remarkable death, a notable death, or an honourable death, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, then, yeah, that's cool storytelling. So, as long as it's appropriate and it's fun, that's fine. Um, and the uh, last point is, the GM can always TPK a party. Like, whenever we want, they can just die. Right? Yeah, uh, I mean... <laughs> they, um... I, I, I will concede. I think I will concede to one or two of those, but I'm going to let Rumble uh, go first. Um, well, um, I just kind of want to throw in, and this may be me being incredibly naive as a probably the I, I'm going to assume the newest player here. 
Um, I think I'm I'm more on board with what we just said. Is I think TVK anytime, any place, and I'll go a step further. No, don't wait till level three. From one onwards, as soon as you start, there should be that threat of it could all go to pot at any time. Because I think, in, for me anyway, that makes it, it, there's stakes to it. It makes it really fun when you get into a fight. And the first game I ever played, I was playing a cleric and the GM had these crazy homebrew rules on crits where if you crit, you roll a d20 and depending on the damage it did like additional effects so you could have like your arm chopped off and then that was going to take like months to grow on back or if it was radiant damage you could be blinded for like a week and so as the cleric i was running about in this first fight trying frantically to keep everyone alive and it was stressful as hell but it was fun as hell and it was like it's my first ever game and i feel like everyone's about to die but it was so much fun (laughs) and so i just think with that level of yeah we could all i think as long as because like the gm she explained it she explained these are my homebrew rules this is what's going to go down the fights are going to be hard you're going to have to deal with it and we need a cleric and i was like i'll play a cleric it's my first game yeah. see how this goes. <laughs> but it was so much fun so i think if you explain it well enough and i think it's down to the people you're playing with as well if the players are cool with it make it brutal I think it makes it more fun, but that might just be me, and I haven't been TPK'd yet, so maybe I'll change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it, I love it. I think I think you're right, it's that player, setting player expectation. Like, if you go in and you're not expecting to die early, then it sucks. And that's why I set my little limit, because it is my player groups, you're quite right, thinking about it. None of them would be very happy, well, apart from Zaynef, who'd be chuffed, I think, if he died in session one. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can just add it to a collection of stupid things he'd done in roleplay games. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it's it's if you set the player expectation and they're all cool with that, go for it. Mm. Knives out. So I, so I'll say for just before um, Pete uh, speaks in, um, I will say that again when it comes to like say for me, if I was to TPK a party, I I don't think I will ever so much as like pull my punches because again like if you're coming up against a particular type of monster that monster is not suddenly like oh i i could have attacked this thing that's on the floor and completely killed it but no i'm going to move on to something else unless it was like something of a bit of intelligence and had a reason that it wanted to take everything you know as you're going up against a bit of a mindless beast it's not thinking strategy so i don't i wouldn't look at it and think well the dm's got to think strategy as well and try to not kill everyone off so I mean I won't again I wouldn't go out of my way to try to kill the entire party but if the opportunity arises and it's come from players choices I want people to see that they have there are consequences for it and my hope is that maybe it just makes them be a little bit more tactful when it comes into the combat all right cool I I think I have varying views on this topic, just in general, but one of them is is definitely actions have consequences. I think there's there's a level of, if the party's going to do something which is very clearly beyond them, and then they're going to put themselves in a position they shouldn't be and just get themselves killed, then yeah, you shouldn't pull your punches because the party made a bunch of bad decisions. But I'm also aware of someone who has had a death like this, pointless deaths irritate me. I think it's it's almost like Chad uh, was saying earlier of if it's if it makes sense or if it's like a worthy death or a story death or something that um, I'm much I'm much like yeah right whatever. But if it's just the DM felt like rolling a dice and now I'm dead for for not many oh i mean an example like crafty was there for was we were what a level level three level four party and our dm introduced the deck of many things oh god yeah Uh, (laughs) yes that weapon of mass party destruction yeah party campaign killer and i pulled the card which was you get transported to like another realm and you're trapped basically and the only way to locate you 
you, not even get to you, is via wish spell. So it was basically just, okay, cool, because the deck of many holdings there, we've drawn it, and now my character's just gone. There's no validation, there's no, like, joy, there's no sort of, like, honor in that death. It's just like, cool, he, he's just gone. And that, I think the rest of the party ended up attempting to fix that and fixing it by drawing like four or five other cards and hoping for the best and making a deal with death itself and it was just like what like it felt pointless and i think that's that's the thing with death that i i don't like about D, &D is when when they feel like there was no reason for it and it just kind of happens but if it's the party's gone out of their way or for something they shouldn't and it's very clear that they shouldn't like Someone's been like, hey, let's go up that mountain. I want to go find Tiamat. Won't that be great? It's like, you're a level three party, but okay. <laughs> um, then, yeah, I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to TPK you because no one likes TPK, even though you decided to fight Tiamat at level... Like, you know, there are actions have consequences. But if there are consequences, I want it to be because of my actions and not because randomness. I think that that's, that's my main thing about it. Hmm. I, I think I would agree on that one. Like wouldn't just yeah it, it, it would have if it had like a proper purpose like to it would be would be pretty good but at the same at the same time if if it, like you take your scenario if they wanted to go and try to fight Tiamat for some reason I allowed that to be at the top of a mountain she'd be like well okay sure it was nice it was nice knowing this party I hope you've all got your second character sheets ready <laughs> but uh, uh Chad did you uh, have something you wanted else you wanted to throw in Oh, hang on. No, uh, yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> I know, my mic's playing up to now, I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Um, I agree. If players make stupid choices, then you could... All right, go TPK them if they want to go and take on an Ogre Warlord and his army. Sure. If they want to take on Tiamat, sure. You can try that. But I would put obstacles or suggestions in their way that make them realise that, hang on, actually, that'll mean you know the death of this character and the party like i think we've all done it as gms when a player's gone i mean i wish again zaynef was here because he's said several things um case in point uh on top of um the mast of a ship in a magical storm that was sent to try to sink the ship because the party were on it and uh, not that they knew um he tried to jump from one mast to another and uh, i was like okay are you sure you want to do that? And I think that's an immortal phrase for all GMs when players yes. are like, oh no, I've made a terrible choice. <laughs> it's uh, the most subtle it's... way of a hint to tell people, like, you are going to die if you continue. And what I love about it is I don't even mean to say it. And I find myself being like, <laughs> you're sure you want to do that? Like, uh, trying to work out how I'm going to save that character or the story or the party from their decisions. And then they're all like, oh, hang on a minute. Are we sure? So gentle reminders that they're making a stupid decision can can stop that but if they still make the stupid like if, and he said yep i'm gonna i'm gonna still do it and i was like okay cool um getting ready to find out what i could do and then he rolled a one uh <laughs> and several other members of the party was was said no i don't think you were sure you wanted to do that did you um and i and they managed to fix that because i use inspiration in a different way which but we'll talk about that in another session um short story is I allow them to spend like a pool of inspiration points to change story events oh. um, yeah it makes them feel more involved it's a system I have uh, borrowed and adapted from one that was you taught to me by one of my early GMs um, and it's because uh, I think inspiration in D&D &D is just a bit underwhelming um, you, like the rules are you can have one of it at any time and all it does is allow you to effectively get advantage um, I don't think that's it does it giving players agency giving players choice is more fun so they can just spend a pool of it between the party and then they can change it so they kind of backtrack that and save jason's life um so yeah let players make mistakes but try to gently ward them away from doing so perhaps yeah i i i, I completely agree with that i'm i'm all for giving the players subtle hints um i wouldn't want to just outright tell them unless i don't know and I guess if I was, if I really, really wanted to be lenient with the party, if they were all like so quite new to it, and they they loved their characters, I probably I I probably cave a little bit and say like, 
if the, if the subtle hints weren't coming across well enough, I probably then at that point would flat out say, it's like, guys, if you do this, you are losing all your characters. But I'd say for the majority of the time with the people that I've got, I know that the mass majority of them are, are fairly confident with the games that they, they quite understand about that sort of situation. So I think the subtle hints would be enough. And if they then decided they weren't going to take those hints, then it's, I think it's, oh, it's fair game, then let's roll that dice. Yeah, I feel like, you know, players who make those stupid choices, like I'm going to fight TMA at level three, they're, they're not taking the game, and I hate to say this because it's a game and it is meant for fun, but they're not taking it seriously enough. Like, if you've prepared an entire campaign and the first thing they do when they hit level three and get their subclass is like, now let's go and fight a dragon god, you're like, well, thanks. <laughs> I had literally 100 hours of gameplay set up and you're going to ruin it in, in like the, the tent. It's, so the soft reminders are like, actually, yeah, that's not what we're here to do. That that usually works. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen players die for stupid reasons. I, uh, <laughs> I also agree with, um, I think it was Peter who said it about the deck of many things. Yep. Um, I, I love the concept of the deck. I absolutely do. But having that negative play experience of drawing a card and being like, oh, something bad could happen, and then being like, I'm exiled to a realm where you have to expend huge amounts of resources to get to, um, and effectively removing me from the campaign. Like, as a GM, to get that player back in, you have to do a lot of work um, to try to provide ways for the party to do that. As a party, you have to do a lot of work, and it slowly tracks the entire campaign. Like, I'm all for them losing an arm, you know? And suddenly they're losing a whole pile of bonuses or like you know other negative things um the other one that i used to really enjoy uh was wild magic and they fixed it in fifth edition um and it's a little more fun and i love that you can use it for story reasons as a gm um but it used to be that when you cast a wild magic spell you rolled a dice and if you got wild magic then some bad stuff could happen not very often but the worst thing or the best thing that could happen is um, at level, if you cast a level 1 spell and it went wild, you could then end up casting a level 9 spell. Um, there's a rather short list of level 9 spells, and one of them is Gate, which summons an Archfiend from, the, the, <laughs> from Infernus. Um, and what a lot of players do, and I knew this, because, uh, oh, well, yeah. Um, but a lot of players are like, yeah, I'd love to summon an Archfiend. That'll solve all our problems. Imagine doing that in a tavern at level 1. Like, well, no tavern, no level 1, because there's nothing in the spell gate that says you actually bind it to your will, where all the other spe summoning spells did. So this Archfiend just turns up and is immensely peeved that he's been taken out of his palace in hell by this level 1 wizard. And um, it usually ends up with a TPK, because literally no one can deal with that. Um, and in the, the game Baldur's Gate, you can do this. Uh, in Baldur's Gate 2, I think. Wrath of Baal? Or Throne of Baal, that was it. And it happened. And it was fun, and it was fine, and it happened a couple of times. But it was fine because we could load up. We could, like, unwind it and go back every time it happened and it went wrong. In a real thing, that kind of random death isn't... It's not rewarding, as Peter said. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, Schnitzel, Rumpel, either of you got anything else you want to add in on this? Okay, great. Moving on to the uh, <laughs> moving on to the final I topic. I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as a as a as a teacher, crafty, I can tell you that you have to give people about 15, 20 seconds of time, and that can feel like a a long time to count on your head, but it's worth it. You get good answers. Fair enough. I'll fix it in post. But, um, no, <laughs> most, most most things have been said. There wasn't really much else, to be honest. So no. As I said, it's a topic I don't know that much about, so I, f I feel I said my piece. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, mate. Fair enough. Uh, Schnitzel, do you have anything else uh, to add in on that? Uh, no, I said what I said. I said what I said. Nice. Nailed it. <laughs> uh, hey, Crafty, can I ask a question? And if you say no, I understand. But um, I have. To is it all right because I've been into topics ever if I sneak out on the story one because I got to get back to my wife. She just texted me and said that uh, she needs me for something. And uh, I told her it'd be about an hour, so it's been about an hour. Okay, so no problem. Out. Yeah, let me just do okay. uh, a quick bit then and I'll, I'll give you an out. And enjoy your time behind the bike show. <clears throat> Oh, thank, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that, <laughs> what? Sorry, I just realized I'm not translate across the pond, but... 
<laughs> my my wife needs me for something, and I have to go right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure you do, buddy. I uh, yeah. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more fun than talking about D&D. &D. Go enjoy it. <laughs> well, my, my wife is pregnant, so... No, he's already uh, had the fun behind the bike like shed. That. That kind of yeah. Thing, yeah. Well, hey, bike like... Shed. Bike shed. That's what you said. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What do you think I said? A lot goes on behind Oak the bike. Boat shed. Boat shed. And I was like, that's so boat random. Shed. I don't know. Specifically a boat shed. Yeah, but yeah, not any normal <laughs> shit, not a bike shit, but it's, 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 a, it's a historic term, I am a history teacher, so you know, before there were bikes, there were boats, and I, I don't know. Okay, I have so much to edit out. <laughs> or do you, <laughs> keep it all. Yeah, yeah, Keep yeah. it all for the bloke, for the game. Honestly, just cut time. it, put it out for the outro, or for the episode. <laughs> That's what I do with my vids, man. Yeah, to be fair, as the credits are going, it's just five names, it's just Yeah, random. yeah, yeah, it's like, and then you do a fade, saying. yeah, fade to black, and... Um, watch my Civ video, Crafty. And, like, at the end of that, there's, there's some great stuff about... <laughs> I would definitely give that a go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we move on to the final topic, uh, Schnitzel needs to head out. So Schnitzel, I want to thank you very much for taking the time out to discuss your thoughts and opinions here. Do you want to uh, give us a little outro as you leave? Thank you all for listening. I am Schnitzel and I am out. Excellent. Right, uh, so on to our next topic. Uh, how many players are too many for a party? Now this is a bit, this might be a bit of, a, a bit of an open one because I mean obviously everyone might have their different opinions on this. I think the average, uh, again I could be wrong on this one, I think the, the sort of sweet number from what I've seen in uh, like Reddit forums and Discord and that sort of stuff um, seems to be five. Now I've, I've personally, I haven't been in a campaign with fewer than, say, six, whether that's me being a DM or I've been a player. So I've I've not known any I've not known it to be any any smaller than that. So quite interested to hear what you, uh, what the rest of you got to say on this one. I I think it depends on a lot, really, because I know I think it depends on how you react around missing players. Because if it's, oh, player's missing, we're going to carry on, then having a few more is maybe better because it means the numbers aren't changed as much, and, you know, it, it, it doesn't have that impact. But if you're doing a whole, oh, we want everyone to be there, more people means that more people are, more chance of someone missing, and you might have to cancel more sessions and things like that. And then on top of that, it also heavily, I think, depends on the players themselves. Like, if you've got players that are constantly, like, shouting and talking over each other and not listening to each other, then having too many players becomes a problem. But if it's a group of three people, or then it becomes easier, but then it also depends on their experience, because more experienced players might be able to balance when they're talking and when they're not a lot better than a bunch of people who have never played D&D &D before. So it's it's... There are a bunch of factors that kind of apply to how many is a good number and how many can even be manageable, I think, in certain situations. Yeah, I, I would agree on that one. Like, I d definitely I can understand with the, the higher number of people. I, like my first campaign, I uh, believe the DM had nine players and... Wow. Yeah, and I think it was maybe on four separate occasions, all nine players were there. So it was nearly every session he was having to say, right, well, players one, two, three, and four uh, have decided to go and carry on drinking in the tavern. And the rest of you decided to go to the top of a mountain and find Tiamat for some reason. All <laughs> <laughs> packs. But um, as I'd say, again, six, I've, I've not found as a, as a big is a big deal. I think when I first, the first time I was playing a, a campaign, I was looking for a Discord group and I was looking for like advice. And I said, you know, I've asked people around and I said, I've got six. I had a lot of people coming back saying, oh, you don't want six. It's just like, it's too many for a first time. And I guess I could see in retrospect now, like what a lot of them were sort of getting at. Because again, it, I mean, the main problem, it, well, well, one of the main issues I saw with it is obviously people's availability. Now I've been, I've been quite lucky, you know, Touch wood. Uh, that pretty yeah, much. That sounded like wood. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that ringing noise. Touch wood. Um, are, are you familiar with what a tree is? 
try that again. Touch wood. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been quite uh, fortunate that I've only ever had like one or two players uh, not be involved. It's changed quite recently, only because one of our players um, is now in the military, so his availability has drastically come down on that one, which is uh, again it's understandable. But I find that the other one, the other issue is. And this has been touched upon with us uh, within like session zero or like where you're starting out is uh, gauging the everyone's experience so if they're all fairly experienced with the game you can still get through like rounds of combat relatively uh, easily whereas if they're all new players and you've got a high number of players then you have then that's where i think you've got your, your really big issues because then you can find stuff that drags out that maybe you'd only planned for I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, half hour to be around this and before you realise it, you've done the entire four hour session in one combat because all your players are spending like their entire turn and everyone else's turn uh, just trying to understand what the characters can do. I think I think that's a very good point. Like D&D is a very combat focused system and a lot of D&D DMs will turn around to me and say, no, there's all this other stuff you can do. And then I'll introduce them to a Call of Cthulhu character sheet, which has basically no methods of fighting on it if you want to be productive in the campaign. Like, and so a lot of the time in a DD and d session is often taken up by combat, because D&D &D combat is also quite... Um, I'm going to use the word slow, but it's, yeah, it's immersive. You get into it, there's decisions to make. It's engaging, so I don't think it being slow is... I don't mean it in a negative fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does eat away at a session's time, and the more players you have, you have to multiply that. And often, as a GM, if you're having a, a combat session, you will scale it to the number of players there are. So you'll have more things to do yourself as a GM, and that's just more dice rolling, and if every round has, like, an extra 10 seconds on it, it adds up. Um, so I think... Um, now, I would advise, Pete, the sweet number I think you want in your party is five regular players. And that means that like, you can have more, but if some of them aren't there all the time, then you can phase down. And even with five, you'll probably only have, like, 50% of the time you'll have four people. But you want about four people a session. Having a fifth isn't that difficult, and it gives you flexibility if, if someone's not available. Um... I think anything above that is uh, is difficult to manage. And I say that because I don't know if you were referencing it, Bets, uh, Crafty, but you um, you may remember a Zombies campaign in Savage Worlds that you played in briefly many, many moons ago that I ran. I do vaguely remember that. And uh, you were there for about three sessions and there were nine uh, people involved in that. Um, and what I had to do is siphon it off into groups of activity. So, um, same as you do in a in a classroom now. Mm. Uh, so this is valuable experience across what's it, uh, transferable <laughs> skills. Um, so if like four people all want to go to the pub and try to do some investigation there, then you say, okay, you go that. You talk about what you're going to do in your group there. If five people want to break into the vault, then you do that. And you just as as one group's planning what they're going to do, you're have, giving the spotlight of your attention as a GM to the other group so they can role play it and then when they've done it they can talk about their results and then watch the other people so you can manage larger groups it's hmm. it's possible but it's it is difficult and I um, also like getting everybody together all the time oh, they, in person is harder so online it might be more possible but I think I think six is the sheer maximum that I would want at a table unless I knew the players very well Anything, Pete? Yeah, yeah. Rumpel? No, just kind of follow on from that. Going, yeah, like as I said, I'm, I'm probably the least experienced here, and I, I even I would say six would be around about the max. I think any more than that, you're either diluting your sit like everyone in the group. Not everyone's going to get the chance to really be involved every session. No one's going to have their little moment everyone's you know they might have a game where they might really not do anything if you have kind of more than that so mm. um 
okay. likewise with less people you kind of i think with less people you need more experienced people that's just kind of a guess at me to be honest going that with less big fights harder fights everyone needs to know what they're doing they need to know all their skills all their abilities all their spells so i think six is a pretty good number yeah I five and six i think i think the takeaway from this would be is depending on the the number of players you've got and their experience a lot of it is obviously well pretty much all of it's going to come in down to the dm with how comfortable they feel uh, handling that many because you might have to take a leaf out of uh, Chad Stick's book about how you can sort of split the group up. Uh, it obviously that is involving a lot more. You got to take into consideration it's going to be a lot more work on the DM's part. So if you out there, you're a DM and you're looking to you know get a group together, do take these sort of things into consideration. Fewer people uh, probably means you can get more done in a session. It's a little bit more compact, uh, much faster to sort of get around each member. Larger groups, you, you know, whatever you've got planned for that session, you might need to uh, take some of that out because those those little each of those segments are going to spread out and take a lot more time. And then obviously take into consideration the experience of of everyone playing. And that's obviously going to take play into a factor. Um, so you, Chad, so you you mentioned about uh, you know obviously if someone's like say you have your your five and then there's like another person or like you, i think you said there was four and then you'd have a fifth and if they weren't there all the time you sort of phased them phased them down or phased them out uh so how do you because this is something that I've, I've i've experienced uh i'm pretty certain uh pete's experienced this as well uh, and we have touched upon this i think in a previous session um in regards to like how would you go about dealing with people um, not being around and I think we were looking at the time I was looking at it from so if you've got like a key event uh, or something like you could like depending on what what the situation is and like whether you needed those you needed that character to be there for it then you try to find maybe some sort of filler or if you maybe possibly look at postponing but we sort of agreed that with the majority of people there you go with the majority so if you've still got five out of your six players you keep pushing forward with that game but it's just sort of how you do continue continue that on my main thing i'm thinking about is how do you go about when you're phasing a character out is it a case of you simply say ah oh, well they are they've they're they're with you guys but they've fallen behind or would you play as their character for them to keep them involved or would you just say something like just completely out of the blue it's like they've been sucked into another dimension <laughs> randomly <laughs> i i'm gonna um i'm gonna blow your mind and say none of that um, I, well, it might not blow your mind, it's not that impressive, but uh, <laughs> what I do is at the end of each session, like I, I'll, so at the moment with, with my regular group, I'm playing um, from about half six till 10 p.m. And, but we can finish any time, like, depending on what the scenario is, we sometimes finish at 20 past nine. Like, if they're about to get into a big fight or, you know, an important moment's about to happen that's going to take a lot of time to resolve. So I have kind of checkpoints. And that's when I'll end a session. And it means that they're at those checkpoints. There is often, if someone is there and then can't be there next week, they can be doing something else in world. Like, they are guarding. Uh, so recently, uh, the party went into some tombs. Um, that were that where they could find some relics. I say recently, this is a month or so ago. Time travels differently in D and D. Um, yeah, so they uh, they and so five of them were all there the session before when they got to the tomb. But then the next session there was only three of them. So I said two of them are guarding the horses to make sure because there's other people trying to get this relic, so they were guarding against that. It's an in-story reason. It's thematic. It makes sense. And the other thing I do is those players are still there. So, like, one of them it comes from a big sailing background and he's a ranger. And so if they need something, if he's not in the session, and he's not been for a couple of sessions, but they need something that, you know, they're able to say, actually, Grim would know that. Uh, I'll be like, yeah, he would. And then I'll either I'll text the player and say, hey, can you roll me a d20? Or if they, and if they don't get back to me in five minutes, I'll roll it myself and see what they get. And then they, that character still contributes. So I like, don't ever role play a character for them. Um, I just try to make them relevant and useful so they can still be used for their benefits. Uh, and when it comes to combat, I usually say they handle themselves and rather than rolling it because it's not 
if I involve them too much in the combat, then they die or they suffer like a lot of hit point loss. I think that some players might feel uh, cheated somehow. Like it wasn't my fault that I lost 39 hit points in that last combat. Um, I wasn't even there. So I have them there thematically, but mm -hmm. I don't have them there practically unless I need them to. So like if like realistically, if they get ambushed by goblins and the players are really struggling, then I can have, say, the bar the Dragonborn Barbarian, if he's not there, I'd have him handle his one fairly easily and help them out a bit. And then I'd okay. start rolling for him. But I wouldn't do it from the beginning or, and I wouldn't target him while he wasn't there. Um, so yeah, just give him a task in world. Like, often my checkpoints are in towns and things and they can be off doing something else and I'll often give players again, I'll text them and I'll say hey, you, we've got a WhatsApp group I'll put on there, guys who aren't here you're in this town, what do you want to be doing and that still gives them agency in the campaign, they can still get involved in the story and then if they then say, oh I'm just going to spend the week in the tavern um, that's them saying it, it's not me saying they just get drunk, because yeah. that's unfairly role playing their characters um, and equally, if they say, oh, I really wanted to go and get in touch with the Thieves Guild somehow, I want to try to attract their attention, I'll have them roll some dice and come up with something that that works. I, I, I actually, I really like, I really like those ideas. I think I'm going to have to implement a couple of those uh, going forward. So uh, next time you're not available, Rumpel, uh, I've, I've got, I've got some things for you lined up. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're... you're... <laughs> You're going up a mountain to have a work with Mr. <laughs> Mr. T. Ammer. Yeah, I've heard he's a lovely guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apparently he ordered a can of whoop ass and he needs to, uh, <laughs> to deliver. Uh, Pete, what about you? What do you, how do you think you would deal with um, the situation of uh, like a, a no-show? I, I think I mentioned previously in um, a different uh, group called thing that uh different episode that i when i first did my when i did my first campaign as a dm i was like you know i really want everyone to be here for every every session and everyone was like yeah no that's what we want we'd like everyone to be there for every session so yeah we're all good to just you know if we skip a session every you know few months like that's not a big deal and then it ended up being six sessions in a row where one person couldn't make it or two people couldn't make it or you know and then sometimes sometimes it was people were ill sometimes they just weren't feeling it sometimes sometimes like something came up and my campaign died because i was like because i didn't know when was the best time to be like you know what if you're not here next session then we're doing it without you um so i think i've i definitely learned from that experience and i think if i if i ever did get around to dming again i would say like if you're not here, we will continue without you unless it is a major thing that you need to be here for. And we'll only ever skip like one session ever, like at a time. Like because I yeah, that was that was rough way for the campaign to end of just it was literally I think it was halfway through combat. It was like we had like some there was like a small combat session and then another enemy came out and they were like, It's late, we're too tired to do this next bit we'll pick this up next session. And I was like, you know what? Fine. And then the campaign never picked up again. So I was like, cool. Was yeah, so I, I... Hmm? I was going to say, and that was your super villain origin story. Yeah, that was my super villain <laughs> origin story. And now I'm just like, that's it. Like, I... Yeah, I, I wouldn't want that to either cause a campaign to end again or cause me to miss too many sessions again. So I, I think I would be more inclined to keep going if people weren't around. Unless it was like tons of people. But, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've um, I think we've covered that uh, quite well. Unless anyone has any uh, last points that they want to bring up about it. I want to um, validate the uh, supervillain origin story. <laughs> uh, I think you absolutely have to tell players and let, let exactly what you said, Peter. If it's an important integral story moment that's going to be super cool and you want them all to experience delay it by a session um, maybe two weeks at most I say but that's that's up to you um, but you do have to skip them if your players aren't going to commit and they won't like, <laughs> and I, I was laughing to myself as you said yeah I told my players that I want everybody to be there we're going to really commit to this 
And then my players were said, yeah, we're going to really commit to this. And like I said, every group of players ever. <laughs> we're going to be there every week, except when I forget to buy milk and then can't be bothered to leave the house again. You know, <laughs> players will let you down for... Uh, and this is coming from someone with like other supervillain origin stories. So by the time this happened to me as a GM, boy, was my care cup empty. Um, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the idea that players, you know, they want to be there all the time. They don't want to miss it. And I believe that's a very authentic feeling. But, you know, if they double book, d and is the first thing they'll drop. It's uh, And if, if they decide that, oh, I've had a tough day at work, I just can't manage this and then you know they'll cancel last minute i'm listening to the first episode um in bits uh and i i heard about your 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 tale there and i feel for you man because players as much as they want to be committed they can't be like we're human beings uh, you as a gm can't commit to everything stuff comes up so setting realistic expectations for your party and telling them that they will miss sessions if they're not able to make it at times i think that's very fair yeah, uh, I mean, I know I've I've definitely mentioned uh, in a previous episode. You know, if it's if it's something that is completely out of that player's control, and they at least you know give you the give you some context as to what's going on. Now, obviously, people have got personal things in life. If it's something that they really don't want to go into, that's you know that's not entirely up to them. My thing, I think, was uh, I think it was quite a bit of an issue I would have is if someone was repeatedly. Uh, not join a session and it didn't seem like it was it didn't seem like it was like family emergencies or you know like something serious has sort of happened it's just sort of a case of well they couldn't be bothered oh now they've double booked themselves oh they couldn't be bothered again it's like at that point it's sort of like right well i, I feel like i've got to draw a line in the sand here and to be like if you're not you can't if you can't make it uh, for the for the fourth time in a row now it's sort of at that point it's like are you really do you, are you really invested in being part of this because you you kind of missed out on quite a lot that's already gone on it's, it seems a bit silly now to sort of bring them into it again because it, it, it might come back in for another session after you've like you spoke to them and then the next session they decide to, to drop off again and again this time no real no real proper reason for it it's just sort of again i feel like you're just sort of taking away something that you could just you could fo take it away of your focus whereas you could have it more on like what's going on with the campaign yeah i think uh the other thing that you can do is incentivize people to to look, reward people for filling in the people who have missed out so mm -hmm. to try to keep them up with what's happened so what i do is at the beginning of each session i have someone a man saying this out loud makes me realise that I use a lot of DM techniques when I'm teaching. Uh, at the beginning of each session, <laughs> I have one, I like, hey, who's low on inspiration? Because I, I up the max to three. Who's low on inspiration? Who wants to fill in the people uh, who weren't here last week and what you did? Or who wants to remind us where we were? And then that's an easy way for them to earn a point of inspiration because they get to tell the story in character. And that way, players who weren't there sort of feel like they pseudo were because they're getting the story back from another character and it's also immensely fun as a gm when you've my favorite time this has happened has actually been very recently when uh, all five of my uh, on the on the thursday all five of my party were able to show up and then on the friday two of them couldn't um and then a third one dropped like at seven and they were really apologetic and like they were they were it was something serious with their partner in illness so it was okay but the other two were already there and had like paid their, their table fee at the the shop so i was like guys perfectly happy to run a session with you two and um it was great because those those two were like they're completely inexperienced at D and D, and they were the ones who made the worst decisions under pressure. So they went on this, <laughs> this spree of trying to do, honestly trying so hard to do the right thing. And then in the next session, I was like, "So, um, Alendil and um, uh, and Jam, would, would one of you like to fill in the rest of the party and what you got up to last week?" <laughs> and they looked at each other and they went not really <laughs> uh, and then they, they still had to but um it's fun and it, it really brings the characters together and that way that people who miss a thing again as i said before feel included so it's 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 a way to incentivize them to come back because they're not missing it so much 
touching a bit upon the, you saying you sort of having that, that bit of crossover, at what point have you started asking students to roll dice? I mean, I've, I almost, um, <laughs> I almost, I almost enslaved a class of students to represent the um, terror of the middle passage until my head of department told me it was possibly not the best way for my first lesson with a class to um, make them into slaves. Uh, so I was rolling dice goes. Yeah, I know it was bad. I was, I was good. It was so good. Like I talked to him before. And I talked to the teacher. I'm taking the class over from, and they were both like, "I love your enthusiasm. This sounds like because it would really get across the message of how terrible it was." And then I got an email, uh, no, a text on um, Friday night from the head of the department saying, "Look, we really love your enthusiasm, but we've we've spoken about it again, and um, we're not really sure." <laughs> Subjecting. Like even in a in a role play in a very safe environment, subjecting students, year eight students, to the terrors of the middle passage is is a good idea. And I'm like, right, no, fair cop. Um, <laughs> I was I was I was I've got um like a replica flintlock gun. I was going to use it as to represent them being killed if they were too rowdy. We were gonna <laughs> we were getting. <laughs> Like, the more I say it out loud, I'm like, yeah, it was a bad idea to do this, poor 12, 13 year old kids. Um, I was going to have them walk into the classroom and like, they. I was going to have four of them. Um, and these were going to be chosen very particularly to try to get them involved in the lesson to be my crew. And they were going to be given authority. Um, and I, as the captain, was only going to speak to them. And when I spoke to the others, I was going to speak in like gibberish because they wouldn't understand what I was saying. So it would be all the more horrifying and terrifying. These four other students would then have to corral their classmates into these pens I made out of the tables. It was a great idea um, and probably would have been fine in a year 10 class. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but a rolling dice, no, there's too much chance in that. I can't, I can't do that. And then the kids would lie, you know. I feel Sorry. like I've got to start creating a new segment on this, the the, the segue of Chadstick. <laughs> you asked the these... question. No, I, no, I, I'm not regretting any of it. You, you <laughs> gave me the segue. No, no oh, regret. I just think like I, we'll get to this bit and then I'll have like a little jingle or something played. <laughs> <laughs> into the mad I'll get, I'll get spiral of Chadstick's um, thoughts. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can hire like an animator or something just do a sketch of like whatever it is that you're discussing <laughs> just get some visual just, aids just do it in paint and hope it's <laughs> or maybe i'll do it in paint and stick figures i'll see what i can do like it'll, it'll be really bad art but it'll be hilarious <laughs> it, it, it just works <laughs> <laughs> right um i think we're gonna <laughs> I, I think after that we're gonna <laughs> is that better or worse than last time? I, uh, <laughs> let's let the uh, audience decide. <laughs> Viewers, uh, you yeah, might have heard previous session. If not, click right here. I'm going to put something up on the screen to uh, go back to what Chadstick is referring to there. Then rewind a little bit. Re-listen to the story just now. Tell us, which one's more likely to get us cancelled? <laughs> That's my quest, really. I'm just trying to get this entire endeavor cancelled. <laughs> Doesn't want to be a part of it anymore. <laughs> uh, I say, uh, yeah, we're going to uh, wrap the session up there. I would like to thank uh, Schnitzel, Chadstick, Peter, and Rumple for coming uh, to this tonight and yeah, giving us a little bit more knowledge uh, on certain subject matters within Dungeons and Dragons. Do any of you want to uh, say your goodbyes? Never gonna happen by no, looks of it. No well, one you need to give us an order. <laughs> you need to give it, like you said last session, you were gonna do it in order. So we'll that wait. is true. That's we're true. We're all so just, paranoid. I just sort of talking over each other. That we're just like, nope, no one's gonna talk. <laughs> Absolutely. Nah, nah, I, 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 was, I was just doing a bit. It's fine, guys. It's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, Chad Stick, if you wanna say your goodbyes. Hello, thank you for listening. Good night and goodbye. I do not condone child slavery. <laughs> <laughs> or any slavery. I don't condone any slavery. That's safe. I'll generalize it. No slavery is better. <laughs> sort that out in post. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an excellent gag reel. Uh, Peter. Uh, all right. Thanks for listening, guys. And I also don't condone sl slavery of uh, any kind. So write that down. And on to <laughs> Rumple. Yep, bye, thanks, and I, I, I feel like I shouldn't have to say it, but I also don't <laughs> condone slavery. <laughs> I feel, yeah, I feel like, yeah.
<laughs> and I was going to do the little bit on the end here, but now I feel like I'm responsible for also saying that I do not condone slavery or any kind. I did not generally think I'd have to have ever say that phrase. But there we go. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, we will see you next time.